Hello, everyone. I'm Ed Denzel, and I host Unfound, and I run this YouTube channel. I realize you don't want to give a thumbs up to the following video until you watch it. You know what? That's totally understandable. I can appreciate that. But what you can do right now is subscribe to this channel. The button is right there. Thanks. Chase Allen Lackey was a 25-year-old from Houston, Texas. He had four siblings and was an excellent baseball player. On June 30th, 2017, a Friday, some of Chase's family showed up to watch him play in a softball game. After that evening, repeated calls and texts to Chase went unanswered. He and his dog were never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. All is not as it seems is a cliche we can use quite a bit when we discuss disappearances. Law enforcement may portray itself as the expert on missing persons cases, but they are not. In fact, they are as befuddled as the general public when a disappearance isn't solved after one week. Private investigators may market themselves as saviors. But for a few exceptions, like Elaine Graves, who was just a guest a few weeks ago, most PIs are a big waste of time. Then there are the missing people themselves. Many of them were not who they seemed to be. And their families and friends didn't discover this until after their disappearances. Some examples from Unfound's files. Ashley Kohler. She was a call girl portraying herself to be working for an import-export business. Stephen Kocher, seemingly an honest young man, but his family discovered he was driving all over Utah and Nevada with no reasons for these trips. David Schrader, a family man who had been hiding bottles of alcohol around his house. This not being discovered by his wife, until after David went missing. And there are many more, just like these. We at Unfound make no judgments in any of these situations. We simply acknowledge how difficult this makes solving these cases. Well, with Chase Lackey, he is another missing person who had been hiding things. How are we supposed to resolve these cases involving perception versus reality? And now, a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Linus' website, charlieproject.org. Chase Lackey was an all-around type of guy. He was an athlete displaying the ability to throw a baseball at a young age. He had many friends and acquaintances, and had some girlfriends too. Yes, schoolwork was maybe not his main concern, but Chase was certainly not lazy and managed to make it on his own, living in his own place, despite not having a college degree. From the outside, Chase's life seemed to be going pretty well for a single guy at the age of 25. So, on June 30th, 2017, Chase played in a softball game that his father and sister attended. Everything was as it always was. They parted ways and hoped to talk again soon. However, over that immediate weekend, no one could reach Chase. Worried, Chase's sister went to his apartment with friends on July 4th. They managed to get inside. Chase wasn't there despite his truck being in the garage. His dog wasn't there either. Neither of them were ever seen again. 
What caught the sister's eye, though, the most was the drug paraphernalia and cash counting machine in plain view. Chase had, at some point, become a major marijuana dealer, unbeknownst to his family. Drugs are a common topic on Unfound, as is people living double lives. We, of course, also talk about shady friends. They can all be instigators for disappearances. However, rarely do we have a combination of all three like we do with Chase and the circumstances of this mystery. I would like you to think about that as you try to answer these three questions during the interviews. Number one, if Chase were harmed in some way, would the person or group really want to hurt Chase's dog too? Number two, if something happened at Chase's apartment, why didn't anyone hear or see anything? And number three, what are we to make of two pictures taken days apart after the disappearance that show someone had been in Chase's apartment during that span? Chase's family believes he is the victim of foul play due to his drug dealing. The guests for this episode are Chase's father, Craig Lackey, and one of Chase's sisters, Heather Fretwell. Unfound News. I'm back in Florida after a 10-day whirlwind tour to Illinois, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. How did my disc golfing go at the World Championships? I don't want to talk about it. Next, last week I got to meet Jody Walsh, the sister of Robin Abrams and her son. We had a nice dinner at Cracker Barrel in Ottawa, Illinois. I'm so happy we were able to get together. I wish I had the time and money to get to meet more of Unfound's guests in person. Finally, I need to give a shout out to listener Kelly, who I met on the disc golf course in Peoria. Her husband was in my group. It took her 13 baskets before she admitted that she was a big fan of Unfound. We ended up having a great conversation. Pleasure to meet you, Kelly. Where you can find Unfound. On these following podcast platforms. Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, and many others. Especially outside the United States. Social media sites. YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the newest one, TikTok. Listener support sites, patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast, paypal.me forward slash unfound podcast. The website, theunfoundpodcast.com. The email address, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. And please mention Unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thank you. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound the father of Chase Lackey, Craig Lackey, and Chase's sister, Heather Fretwell. Heather and Craig, welcome to Unfound. Thank you. Thank you for having us. You're very welcome, and thank you for appearing on both uh, in both audio and video form uh, for this episode. Deeply appreciate it. Both of you getting together at the same location is also makes it easier for me, the host. So I appreciate that. Um, let's start here. I, I need to ask. Um, names are kind of a little bit uh, of a thing for me, uh, Craig. If I could ask, how did you choose to name your son Chase? Where did that come from? It was kind of a running joke. Whenever, we, whenever his mother and I were discussing what we were going to name, and it was, like I said, just a running joke between me and her that, you know, I wanted to name Chase with a middle name of girls. Huh. Like, no, we're not oh, doing my. that. And, you know, we laughed it off or that whatever. That's funny. But Chase just kind of stuck. I don't know why, but uh, it's just, I wanted it, I wanted us to have the same initials. But I don't. I didn't want to necessarily have a junior. Uh -huh. so instead of my my middle name is Alan. His middle name is Alan. 
and his uh, grandfather's first name was Alan, but I wanted to, us to have the same initials, but not necessarily have a the same name or have a junior. So okay, Chase is Neat. what I came up with. Okay, so the Chase is not like a family name or anything like it. it's just some no. kind of popped into your head. Yes, sir. Okay, interesting. Thank you for sharing. Okay, it's interesting you mentioned about not wanting to have a junior. Uh, my father's name is also Edward, but I don't have a middle name, and he does. So technically, I'm Edward Denzel, but I'm not a junior. It's very strange. So it's interesting you also talk about that, that you didn't want a junior. Either did my dad, so go figure. Okay, um, Heather, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, the uh, Lackey home uh, growing up? Uh, how many children and Chase, uh, older brother, younger brother, why don't you talk about Chase and the rest of your siblings, if you could? Um, so we have an older sister, Stephanie, who is about to be 39. So she's quite a bit older than me. I'm 32. Um, and then growing up, it was um, the three of us and my parents divorced when I was eight, nine-ish. Um, shortly after my dad remarried, not shortly, but like a little while later. Um, and married my stepmom, Shelly, who they've been together now for 20 years. Um, and we have two other siblings who um, I am 18 and 21 years apart from. Wow. So Seth and Camden are their names. And um, I mean, I was already getting off to college and when they came around. So I don't I didn't have a super close relationship with them, more of like the fun aunt instead of like a brother sister uh -huh. um, but chase was around for a couple more years before um he didn't go off to college so he was still around and we would attend sets t-ball games and um different events like that together and mm -hmm. and try to spend as much time with them while being in our own developing adult lives as well right so chase is your younger brother then chase is my younger brother yes by how many years at about almost two years. Almost two years. Okay, thank you. So you have three siblings, I guess, maybe separation of about eight, nine, ten years in there, and then you have these two other siblings that came along uh, a lot later. Once again, it's something I can uh, identify with. My brothers and my sister are about 20 years older than I am, so that's interesting. Okay, all right. Um, how would you say uh, the, the three of you, the three older three, uh, close uh, kind of your own people and personalities. How would you explain maybe the three older uh, children, including yourself, Heather? Um, we were close. My sister, um, I mean, she's six and a half years older than me. So mm -hmm. we didn't have a whole lot in common. Um, Chase and I were pretty close. I've always been like a mother hen to him and I'm the rule follower. So if he was doing anything wrong, I was tattling on him and, um, Mm -hmm. But then as we got older, we just had a fun friendship more than anything. It was, um, we didn't talk every day. We would sometimes even go weeks, months without talking. Oh. But um, whenever the three of us all got together, it was nothing but laughs, picking at each other, making fun, telling jokes. You know, Stephanie and I would get on to him about his choice of girls that he would date and it, it was always a running joke with him and any girl he dated that it's not my parents. I'm worried about it's my sister because I was always super, very overprotective of him, yeah. even though I was much smaller than he is. I stand about five foot one. So, hmm. um, I'm older, but the smaller. Yeah. Okay. I got gotcha. you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. So we got a little bit of the relationship dynamics, uh, between, uh, at least the three older children. And so let's move on to this. Let's now just talk about Chase uh, as an individual. Um, going back to Craig's, you know, what was uh, some of his interests, hobbies, you know, here is father, things that maybe you tried to get him into, maybe he was interested, wasn't interested. What can you say about some of those things? Well, baseball was his life. He absolutely loved baseball. Hmm. Um, after he graduated from high school, it turned to softball. Um, he was in couple of different rec leagues where, you know, he, he enjoyed playing, but growing up, he was uh, definitely hardcore baseball, made the all-star team basically every year. He was in baseball, wow. went to the World Series one year, and uh, like I said, he just dearly loved the game of baseball and was very good at it. 
uh, I realized that early on that he could throw a ball extremely accurately, even as a toddler. I mean, he could pick a ball up and fire it, and it was, you know, wherever I put the glove, that ball was, you know, right there. Mm -hmm. um, we had a one year when he was playing little league baseball. I went over and showed a coach uh, who I wanted to coach with and basically like form some type, some sort of super team type thing. But I said, you know, I'm, come here, I want, come here, I want you to see this. And I had Chase put on a pitching demonstration to him and I was hitting the all four quadrants of the strike wow. zone, you know, inside high, inside low, outside high, outside low. And where I put the glove, I mean, that, that's where the ball that's was coming. Uh, one of the coaches that we ended up teaming up with uh, taught him a curveball. And once he got the curveball, I mean, it was pretty much game over. I mean, lights they, out. you know, it was, yeah, it was lights out. He was, uh -huh. uh, when he got into junior high and high school, I think it was a ninth grade team. We were playing a varsity high school team. Here's his, here was his ninth grader throwing curveballs and the high school players were bailing out of the box, you know, mm -hmm. and that ball would come across the plate and umpire strike. And they were just like, couldn't believe it. But I mean, it was, it was just really, he had a, had a huge future had he decided to put the work into it. Uh, like yeah. I said, after him, him and his mom, me and his mom split, uh, it became more of a chore to get him oh, yeah. to go to practice or to, I would say, you know, give me a call, you know, we'll, I'll go, I'll come through with you. Cause I wanted to keep him, you know, motivated and in yeah. that mindset. And it got to the point where I was always doing the call and he never was calling me to go throw. And I said, you either want this or you don't, you know, I can't, I can't make it. I can't make you want it. If you don't want to do it, you know, I'm not going to keep pushing you. So you call me when you want to go throw. And he called me a few more times after that, but uh, huh. like I said, he just, okay. I don't know that he lost interest, but he used to have the drive for it for whatever reason. I don't know yeah. Why. Yeah. It's one of those things tough to get and sometimes get kids motivated. I, I, I can, I played baseball myself. I was a pitcher and sometimes the motivation to practice, to play. Yes. But to go out and practice sometimes tough for a teenager to get into that. That's maybe yeah. totally understandable. Well, he sounds, uh, he sounds very talented. It sounds like a very natural athlete. Okay. What about, um, uh, school? How do you do in school? Uh, smart, uh, put work into it. What would you say about, uh, that part of it? Maybe we'll go back to Heather, what you remember about his schooling, if you can say. Um, well, he was smart and he did not want to put forth the effort to maintain that, um, I think he had a lot of pressure on him. I was a straight A student, um, very smart, all AP classes, things like that. And I think he felt pressure to follow up with the same level of intelligence that I had. Um, and so he just it kind of was like a thing where baseball became his thing. And as long as he was passing so he could play, that was good enough for him. Um, he was more of the jokester, the class clown. Um, he liked to make people laugh and that's really where he got his joy from was making other yeah. people laugh. Okay. All <laughs> right. So, uh, maybe, uh, like you said, some pressure there, maybe, uh, older sister is a, an achiever, uh, and maybe some, feel some pressure there. Okay. And you talked about his personality. So then you would say that he was uh, fairly popular in high school. He, I don't want to say he had like a lot of close knit friends. He had a lot of acquaintances. A lot of people knew him, even um, to this day, people will be like, was Chase was your, your brother. Cause I'll post something about him on social media. Um, you know, I don't have the same last name as him anymore. So whenever people see that or new people that I meet, they're like, oh, wow, I heard about him or I knew of him or um, he had a lot of acquaintances for sure um, through different aspects of his life, through work or um different baseball teams he played on softball teams um so he he knew a lot of people oh, and wow. from what i knew of him he didn't have a lot of enemies so mm -hmm. um but he was just i mean everyone says he was an all-around great guy funny good to be around fun to be around okay 
Uh, you'd already mentioned this earlier, so I might as well, and I was going to, it's on the outline anyway, so we'll just talk about it now. What about uh, usually guys that are popular and funny do very well with uh, women? How, what, what can we say about that? Either of you maybe can answer this question, just maybe from a parent's point of view and a sister point of view. What about uh, girlfriends, maybe even outside of high school going into his early 20s? What, were the, what was that situation? Not it. <laughs> <laughs> there, there were a number of girls that I actually got to meet that he had brought over. Um, like I said, some I liked extremely well, some I didn't like as much. And, yeah. you know, typical one you don't like as much seems to be the ones more he gradu gra gravitated to. So, uh, yeah. he, Trace has a hugely kind heart. And if anyone was struggling or in a situation, he was there to help them pull him out of it. He wanted to be like the savior. Mm -hmm. And so for me, as a sister's point of view, it was always, what does she have to offer? What can she bring to the table? Because it sounds like she's contributing nothing to this relationship and you're busting your butt. She's living with you. She doesn't cook. She doesn't do your laundry. Like, what is she helping out with? But again, I was just the okay Big, older yeah. protect yeah. overprotective sister yeah right and you're looking at it from a woman's point of view which can be right. very helpful absolutely okay um but he was would you say at the time of his disappearance was he uh dating anybody I, I, the understanding is he was living by himself but was was he dating anybody anybody if he was she was under wraps from me which usually that was the case until he knew for okay. sure it was gonna be a for sure thing okay what about you craig any idea no i no? I don't know. Okay. Let's uh, maybe, uh, we're going to talk about his work next, but maybe just, uh, you know, the, the, the iron work that he eventually got into, but what about high school jobs, uh, any sort of jobs like that between going to school, maybe he was playing some baseball or softball. Did he make any money uh, doing any sort of job like pizza delivery or anything like that? Um, he worked at a local rest uh, Mexican restaurant for a little while. Um, I think mostly in the summers, it was hard for him with baseball practice and things like that to be able to work but I think on the weekends um he would do serving at Iguana Joe's okay uh maybe I should ask this as well being that Craig uh, you and your uh, and Craig's mother uh, I mean Chase's mother ended up getting divorced uh what was the custody arrangement uh at the time uh when this happened what, how did the that all get worked out standard every other weekend and every Wednesday night and okay. two weeks out of the summer it? No, it was like six weeks four weeks no, it was yeah like six a month. Weeks. yeah pretty stand pretty standard then yeah okay okay and so would you say that uh for chase he was then because of this arrangement maybe around his mother more than he was around you or would, would you say it was yeah. 60 40 what would you say no he was definitely around his mother more than me okay all right thank you all right so let's move on to this um this work that he got into ironworking craig let's talk about that your understanding and how he ended up getting into this when did he get into this how did he get drawn to that what do you know about that uh that's something i actually don't know anything wow. about to be quite honest with you wow uh, he told me he'd gotten into it and told all the time about how much he loved it mm -hmm. uh, he was he loved the thrill of being yeah. up high um he's as i i don't know how he got into it either um mm -hmm. but i know that that was one thing he enjoyed i mean he you would you know walk across these beams and not be harnessed or i mean taking very risky pictures and things like that uh, which i think cost him a couple jobs along the way wow. um, and they eventually be blackballed i believe okay okay yeah. We'll certainly get into that. Sure. Okay. So um, maybe I'll ask you this then. Were you surprised when you found out that that's what he was doing for both of you? Or was that kind of a surprise to you or or what did you think he was you know, going to do? Surprise not? I wouldn't necessarily say surprised so much as I could see that because he was always an adrenaline junkie type person, mm. I think, um, you know, living on the edge you know, stuff like that, you know, being several hundred feet up in the air, walking steel beams, that's pretty much on the edge as far as I'm concerned. And mm -hmm. so, like I said, I'm not surprised, but uh, I can definitely see where he was drawn to that as a career choice. Okay. I was and it had a job and was making money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, and we'll get into uh, the, the 
what you said about the blackballing here, of course, in a bit. But how many years would you say that he did that that job? Just a guess. Three or four. Oh, yeah. Well, all right. So he might have started that something. in like 2013, something like that. Something around there. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. Uh, his apartment. He was, of course, living by himself at the time of his disappearance. How did it come to be, if either of you know, uh, how he ended up being in the apartment that he was in? Did he ever have a roommate? Uh, how long he'd been living by himself before he went missing? Um, so I can speak on that. He um, had a roommate for a good while um, at a house. Um, his friend owned the house. He basically rented a room from his friend. Um, for a couple of years, I believe they lived mm -hmm. together. Um, they ended up having a falling out. Mm -hmm. Come to find out Chase was living in his car oh. um, for a while. So I, um, my ex-husband and I said, you're coming to live with us. This is going to be the ground rules. Um, yes, you're an adult, but you know, you're not here for like, I mean, we weren't making him pay rent um, or contribute to anything, but he had to be like actively looking for work. Yeah. Um, so he lived with us for, I want to say about four or five months. Um, mm -hmm. he had one stint where he was, um, I think on some synthetic marijuana or something at the time. Um, apparently it was like his last thing that he had and he did that and was, went out driving around one night. Um, I know my dad called me and he was like, is Chase at the house? And I was like, yeah, it's. 11 o'clock at night, like we're, we're all in bed. So I went and checked and he actually wasn't at the house. Um, mm. But he had sent him a text or something that said, I love you pops. Thanks for everything or something mm. like that. Okay. Um, and I don't remember how it came about who ended up meeting him, getting to him wherever he was. Um, and that was the last of that type of behavior from him he ended up getting a job and I don't know if that's when he started iron working or mm -hmm. um if he was just doing construction at the time but he was he got a job was able to start making money um and then he moved out into that apartment in that October of 2015 okay um, I only know that because my son was born in August and my mom was kind of pushing him like Chase you need to give them some space they're a new family and Honestly, like we enjoy Chase's company because he made us laugh. He didn't really contribute a whole lot to like doing dishes or cooking or anything, ah, but he was good company. Okay. We enjoyed his presence at the house. Um, we made a joke that we were, you know, from um, the movie, The Hangover, The Wolf Pack or whatever, we're the three best friends that anyone could have. And um, so it was just kind of a running joke, but okay. it was that October of 2015 that he moved out and moved into that apartment. Okay. So he'd been there in that apartment for a little while before he went missing. Yeah. Okay. And so he lived with you for those five months uh, and it seemed like it was okay. I mean, a lot of people might think of that situation, man, that can be a little stressful and, you know, somebody, a family member coming to stay and everything, but you would say it was not necessarily like that. I, I mean, I didn't have a problem with him being there. So okay. And neither somebody. did, of course, like you said, your ex-husband, uh, you were married at the time. So he didn't have a problem him being there either. Um, no, if he did, he never expressed it, but I mean, the two of them were great friends. So Okay. Um, I mean, I think it, it was working out. We had the extra bedroom, so it was fine. Okay. Either of you, once he got his own apartment and either of you um, go over there very often, maybe once a month ever to visit him, or you, you maybe you're just, hey, he has an apartment. That's a step in the right direction. And would he come and see you guys more? What would you say was the situation? I went over there a handful of times, um, not with any regularity. Um, he generally came by to see his younger siblings. Uh, the one after him would be Seth, which he adored, chased beyond belief. Uh, thinks he hung the moon, the whole ball of wax, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, on our Facebook page, there's a story on the Finding Chase Allen Lackey page where Seth talks about a bet that they had about him eating a whole pizza or what have you. And he tells that story at a vigil we did for him. And like I said, everybody was laughing. And mm -hmm. of course, Fine. Seth was 
Seth was laughing and crying at the same time, trying to get through the story. But yeah, uh, it was it was a very cute story and very touching and moving. Yeah, I mean, he, him being single, I don't think we really did much at his place. I mean, he like we had the baby, so he would come to us or. You know, we'd all get together as a family out at a restaurant to watch Texans games or Astros games or, you know, whatever. But mm -hmm. it wasn't nobody really congregated at his place. And to, I mean, being a single guy, like I, a bachelor pad was not right. <laughs> something I was interested in hanging out at, to be truthful. Yeah. Right. And maybe I should ask, We, even though she's not in this interview, you have an older sister. How, how often would you say that she interacted with Chase? Do you even know? Um, I would say it was pretty sporadic. Um, I don't think any of us really kept in touch with him on a regular basis. I mean, she actually was married. Um, I don't recall if she, I don't think she was married at the time of his disappearance. She had gotten divorced. Um, but you know, she, she kind of had her own thing going on. She like said, she's what, nine years older than him. So, um, but it was, there was no like ill feelings or ill will or anything. It was just, they didn't really have a lot in common in the life stages that they were in at the time. Yeah. Um, Cause she was like was 10 always, years older or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, it wasn't, I mean, she was, he was kind of just like the annoying little brother, but in a good way as okay. he got older. <laughs> All right. I got you. All right. Want to now talk about maybe it's going to seem like an odd place to go in the interview right at this point, but it's going to come up later, and I think this is just the best time to talk about this. Of course, uh, Craig, you've already talked about how uh, well, how good a baseball player Chase was, and you also said that he eventually got into softball, and he was in the softball league at the time of his disappearance. What do you know about this softball league? Is this like one of those softball leagues where different employers put teams together, or was this some type of thing where? people pick teams or friends just to get together. What is your understanding of the softball league uh, that he was in? Because like I said, we're going to, we're going to be talking about this later. To my understanding, it was just a group of friends that got together. Uh, mm -hmm. It definitely was not work related that I'm aware of. Uh, just a bunch of people from the area that enjoyed playing softball and it was a co-ed league. So, you know, it was guys in. Uh, oh, and okay. Guys, and, uh, like I said, just a, mm -hmm. just a group of friends, basically, that, you know. Yeah, just recreational. Okay. Um, my ex-husband at the time was on the same team with him. Oh, he was. Um, okay. Which is why I went out to the games for the most part. But, um, I mean, it was like, it's a league through um, Crosby, which is where we lived at the time. Um and you can either like sign up as a team or you can sign up as like a free agent. And if a team needs one or two extra players, they'll join in. But it was like organized games and the schedule and things like that. Okay. All right. And when it comes to the team, you already said that your ex-husband was on the team. So would you say that this team had a lot of Chase's friends, maybe, for example, from high school on this team or friends he made after high school? Um, how many people would you say on the team were close friends of Chase's? Um, I would definitely say it was after high school friends that he met. Um, mm -hmm. Close friends, I would say maybe one or two, but I don't remember everybody who was on the team, um, truthfully. Okay. Um, I know he got very, very close with one of the members on the team, um, which was kind of like the coach or whatever. And uh -huh. But I don't remember how they met or how that all came about. Okay, very good. All right. Let's, I'm just going to go through some questions now um, that uh, just general questions. At the time uh, before his disappearance, days and weeks, anything bothering either of you about Chase? Any interaction with him? Anything that he said? Anything that he did? Maybe even something, maybe hindsight 2020, but anything, any, like any fears that he expressed, anything like that that kind of comes to mind now, of course, five years since his disappearance for either of you? Nothing that I was ever told about that was bothering him. Uh, mm -hmm. After he went missing, of course, people mentioned the fact that uh, people supposedly were after him okay. for some reason or another, which I had, you know, no knowledge of or right. didn't know what they were after him for or anything like that. Uh, it did seem like that. 
there were longer stretches from when he would come and visit. Mm. And there towards the end, it was always the same excuse. Well, I need to go. I got to go home and, you know, start laundry for work tomorrow. And it's like, Mm -hmm. seemed kind of strange at the time that, you know, he's worried about doing laundry at nine o'clock at night for work tomorrow for the next day. But, you know, Mm -hmm. that was a standard excuse whenever he left of why he had to leave right then. Okay. Uh, Okay. uh, What about you? What about you, Heather? Anything that you now look back at now uh, that maybe should have, you know, any, I'm not saying it could have predicted his disappearance, but anything concerns that you had about your brother, in in 2017 going into the summer of 2017 no um i mean i just i saw him sporadically you know, at softball games so when i could get out there my son was pretty young at the time so mm-hmm. uh, depending on his mood and we actually lived um in the next town over a couple towns over so we were about 30 minutes away so it was always hit and miss whether we would make it out to the softball games um I guess we had to back to Crosby at that time, actually, but um, nothing that stuck out. I mean, people had made comments after the fact that he seemed yeah. more jumpy um, and he was kind of like looking over his shoulder a lot at the games and things like that, but it was nothing. I mean, I had a toddler, so I was kind of right. <laughs> you know, I wasn't look, really focused it. on him. That I much. got you. No, you don't need it. I got you. I totally understand that. I should ask, though, of course, you said your husband at the time was close to him. Anything, if you can say, I'm not trying to get in the in the way of uh, marital privilege or anything. Any you any conversations you and your husband at the time had about him, any concerns that he had being that he was close to Chase, anything he ever said? Nothing that he ever expressed to me, no. Okay, very good. Let's move up to to June thirtieth, uh, which is was a Friday, June thirtieth, twenty seventeen. Let's just talk about that softball game. You actually were both there, and this is just you know twenty four forty eight hours before what we might call the accepted disappearance date of Chase. What do you remember uh, about that Friday? You're both there. Uh, Chase is playing. What do you remember? He'd gotten a base hit and was literally flying around the bases. I was like, oh, my God, I had no idea he was as fast as he was. Huh. Uh, Little League, he was always one of the faster kids. But, I mean, as a young adult, I mean, he was literally just flying on the base pass. And I was like, just like, holy, this kid's <laughs> moving. Uh-huh. And, uh, that That hit. In particular, it was a double, and like I said, he took off down the first base line, never took a break. He hit the bag and had it for second, and was there and just you know blink of an eye, just like wow. Uh-huh. Um, like I said, that I remember like it was yesterday. Yeah, I have no um, recollection of that at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, we had a toddler. That's that's why, right? Yeah, right, we right. had a toddler. I I got you. And like I said, that that stuck that stuck out to me because just of you know the immense speed that he was displaying. I had no idea that he, you know, I hadn't seen him play ball in, you know, five years or better probably. And, uh, but. Well, maybe I can jump in. Maybe I can jump in with that being that you hadn't seen it was then an odd occurrence for both. I mean, even not for you, Heather being your husband was on the team, but for you, Craig, was then an an odd occurrence that you were at a softball game that the chase was in then? Yeah. Cause I, he didn't always let me know when they were, mm. but this particular occasion he did. And uh, I said, I don't think I have anything going on. I said, I'll do my best to make it. And I did end up making it. And, you know, glad at, that, at this point I did because, yeah. you know, last time I saw him, but uh, I right. didn't know that at the time, obviously. But, uh, mm. but that base hit. And then after the game, um, you know, he came up, gave me a big bear hug, and you know, thanked me for coming. And uh, I said, "Well, I said, I'd love to stay for the second game, but I said, you know, I, I got to get home and get in bed because I got to be up, be at work early in the morning." And he said, "No problem." He said, "Love you, pop. And I said, Love you too, son." And mm-hmm. that was our interaction. You know, the last last time I heard his voice, and so. Okay. All right. Did he, did your family, of course, we're coming up uh, July 4th is just a few days away. Did your family uh, have a plan to get together for the 4th, uh, you know, go see fireworks, have a cookout, 
anything like that. Of course, July 4th would have been a Tuesday that year. Um, did you have any plans? Did you talk to Chase about getting together with, with him on that day? Any For either of you, any plans? I didn't. No, um, we were living with my ex-in-laws at that time. And normally we would just do something over at their house. They had some property. Um, I probably said, hey, if you're not doing anything, you don't have any plans. Why don't you come hang out? Um, but there was nothing set in stone that I can remember. Um, it wasn't like a, Hey, I'll see you tomorrow. Cause we're doing X, Y, Z, or it wasn't anything like that. Whenever we left the game that Friday, it was just like a, Hey, I'll see you at the next game or, you know, whatever it was. It was very informal. Whenever I left, I, I probably didn't even tell him by truthfully, cause it was okay. just you know, the baby who was fussy right. and crying at this point and, you know, like right. at home. So, um, but yeah, nothing that I can remember any plans or anything like that. Okay. Thank you. So now, of course, since that was a Friday, June 30th, uh, what do you two, if you two, if you can't remember anything, that's fine. But uh, I, I need to ask these questions because eventually we're going to get to, to July 4th. And, and Heather, this is the day you say, you know, eventually get to what you did that day. But for July 1st through the 3rd, so that would be a Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Do you specifically remember those days? Do either of you remember trying to call Chase or text Chase? Uh, anybody in those days, uh, whether it's a friends or family, ever say to you, you know, I'm trying to reach Chase and he's not getting back to me. What can you say about those three specific days, if you can remember? Saturday, I'm thinking that Heather texted me asking me if I had heard from Chase. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until Tuesday. The last time I text message Chase was on June 20th. So it was 10 days before oh, that wow. game. Okay. Um, and then from my knowledge, it was not until June, July 4th that anything had, wow. anything was wrong. Um, okay. From what I remember was my mom had texted me that morning of July 4th and was like, have either of you heard from your brother, text my sister and I? And I was like, no, why? And she's like, I have been trying to get a hold of him since Saturday, not heard from him. He's not responding to my text. He's not calling me back. Mm -hmm. Um and she had actually sent me some screenshots of their conversation. Um, let me see if it shows the dates real quick. Um, she had texted him on June 29th. Nothing crazy. Um, the morning of June 30th, she had said, call me when you're headed to work. He, she said that he never called her, but we, I mean, we saw him that night at yeah. the big football game. So we know right. he was fine. She texted him on July 1st, got no response, text him again on July 2nd, um, still no response. And then it wasn't again until July 4th, later on in the afternoon, that she was starting to freak out and um, was like, I'm trying to call you, call me back. Um, okay. So for my knowledge, it wasn't until July 4th. And I, I, I say that because. Um, I had posted a status on social media. Hey, has anybody heard from Chase Lackey? Um, his friend Brandon had texted me and said, or messaged me and said, you know, we tried to get a hold of him on Saturday to come hang out with us, but they got no response from him, which was unusual because Chase hung out with, at Brandon's house quite a bit, um, hanging out with his family. They were very close, but um, he, and he thought that was weird, but. Okay. Thought maybe he had made other plans with the, with us or he was hanging out with the family and just wasn't responding to his calls or anything like that. So, okay. so Craig, um, you remember it a little differently then. I no, mean, obviously I mean, uh, Heather that, has documented some of these things, obviously, and that's great, but you yeah. remember things a little differently. Well, I thought I remembered them differently. Looking back, uh, mm -hmm. it was July 4th when she contacted me. Okay. I just went through my phone looking great. for what she was Fine. saying. Great. Um, she contacted me apparently on July the 4th because asked me if I had heard from Chase. And I would sent him a message saying, give me a call when you get this. And that was like a little after 10, the morning of July the 4th. Mm -hmm. And no response. Okay. Do you remember specifically, Craig, yourself trying to call or text Chase in those three days or would that have been common for you to call or text them or, or, or not? Well, what would was, you say? That's why I was just explaining July 4th. Yeah. I, did, I did call and text mm -hmm. him both, you know, give me a call when you get a chance. 
Okay. Uh, when you get this, is actually what I said. Mm -hmm. uh, did it on the 4th, 5th, and again on the 7th. What about uh, that weekend before that? Uh, the weekend yeah. before that. Like the, the leading up to that. Yeah, the, the first through the third. I'm just wondering if you tried just like the day after the softball game that Sunday, just, you know, kind of sitting around wondering what Chase is doing, try to text him or anything. Uh, I would say probably not. Okay. Oh, we had to have some kind of conversation because mm -hmm. communication because he told me about the game and said, you know, if you're not doing nothing, we've got a doubleheader Friday night. So, like I said, right. new phone, I don't have that message. That's Anything fine. July 4th, so. That's, that's totally fine. Okay, I think we have a pretty good idea about this. Now, maybe I'll just ask either of you. In th those three days, most importantly, July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, since then, in the last five years, has anybody who you believe and trust ever said to you, oh, yes, I talked to or I saw Chase? Anybody you saw, text or called or you, once again, somebody you trust, uh, anybody ever said, yeah, I saw or text to Chase during that time? Anybody? No. Zero. Okay, thank you. All right. So we move up to July 4th. Like I said, it was a Tuesday, uh, 4th of July. Maybe uh, both of you have other plans, but Chase is then uh, obviously, as you just talked about, on your minds because um, his mother is trying to contact him multiple times. He's not getting back to her. This is very unusual. So what happens that day? Uh, Heather, what can you say about July 4th and what you did? Um, so it was around... 10 or so that morning, um, my mom had contacted my sister and I asking, you know, have y'all heard from your brother? And we're like, no, why? And, you know, she goes through, I've texted him, called him every day. I haven't heard from him. So I post, you know, the power of social media. Um, he, we've got several mutual friends, common friends. Um, surely somebody's heard from him. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's when Brandon came forward and said, you know, I have been trying to contact him this weekend to come hang out. He, hasn't re returned any of my phone calls or text messages or anything. Um, at some point it came out. I don't know who told me, I don't recall. And I don't have the mental capacity to go through all my messages from five years ago yeah. to find yeah, it. Got, um, yeah. But somebody had said that he used to keep a spare key above his threshold on the outside of his door of his apartment. So my sister and I said, um, we loaded up and we went, um, we, I, it may have been Brandon that said that actually, um, because Brandon, his wife, Erica, and another friend of theirs, um, Nathan, who played on the softball team as well. Uh, we all met at the apartment. There was no key. Hmm. So my sister was like, I drove out here for nothing. I don't know what y'all are going to do, but I'm going back home or going. She had other plans. I don't remember. Okay. Um, Brandon and Nathan were determined to get into the apartment, um, as was I, because I'm like, okay, if his body is in there, you know, we need to know. Right. Uh, and it's, we should make clear though, you saw his truck out there. His truck was there. So you kind of maybe no. thought he was there because his vehicle was there. No, he had a garage and the truck oh, was yo, there. Okay. The garage. Thank yeah. you. So All we right. did not Great. see his vehicle. Um, okay. we have gotcha. his garage. um, so doors were locked. He had, was on the bottom floor, sliding glass door. Um, the guys decided they were going to Jimmy it, get it open, which they did successfully get it open. So we technically broke into his apartment that day for lack of better words, mm, Okay. Uh, fully expecting and preparing myself to see him asleep, passed out, hope, prayerfully not or dead, worse. Him, yes, yes. but not knowing, um, mm. but just kind of hoping to have to see him because you know nobody's heard from him and he was not there um his dog was not there and mm. like i said everything was locked up um his his truck keys were on the counter we went and made sure um the clicker to his garage to open his garage was in there so we went and checked his truck to make sure open the garage truck was in the garage mm -hmm. um looked inside his truck didn't see anything unusual or suspicious or anything like that. Um, okay. And literally no evidence of. All right. I'll just, I'll just ask your point, like no signs of violence, nothing's broken. For example, like a lamp pushed over, 
or, you know, like a plate on the floor, you know, maybe these are cliche things, but just as, as examples. No, sir. Um, nothing that was obvious to me. Um, I mean, we were in there for a good little bit, just kind of looking around, looking, you know, in closets and just, yeah. I mean, I was, I don't say uneasy. I wasn't uneasy. Um, I didn't think anybody was going to like pop out and like nobody was hiding in there, but it was just an eerie feeling, I guess, being there. Um, no signs of, I mean, it looked like as if what my house would look like if I just like had none of my kids here, but I was going to go run to HEB to grab something real quick. Um, and I live real close to HEB, so I could just walk if I wanted to. So right. walk up the house and just run down the street. Um, mm -hmm. it looked, that's what it looked like to me. Somebody came by, he wanted to go grab some food. So they jumped in the truck or vehicle, went to go grab some food and they were going to come right back. Um, okay. uh, so, so you this key that was supposed to be above this landing or kind of hidden, uh, that key was never found has never been found. No, sir. All right. And the keys for the truck were in the truck or in inside the apartment inside the apartment. All right. And was, what, did he have like two keys, I guess, for this place was the key, like on a key, like I keep the key for my condo in Florida on the same key ring as my car. Is that what Chase did or did he do something different? I think they were on the same ring, but I don't remember a hundred percent. Okay. Um, being that the dog wasn't there, was it common for Chase to go places taking his dog? Uh, did he, was he a dog walker? Let's say, like you said, let's say if he would, um, the way you think, and Craig, please jump in as well. If he was going to go down to the local convenience store, 7-Eleven, is this type of thing that he would take his dog with him? Or he'd be like, dog, you're staying here. I'll go by myself and come back. What kind of dog owner was Chase? I mean, I think he would take him places. Like he would bring him over to my house if he would come and see me, mm -hmm. um, which I mean, I have a dog too. So he would let them play together and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this dog was like five pounds. I mean, it was a small, a little little, yeah, it was like a little Maltese or multi poo or something like that. I mean, it was, okay. but that was his little buddy. I mean, he would, mm -hmm. he would sometimes take him places and sometimes he would leave them. Yeah. He'd bring him over. The house. Like Heather said, he'd bring him over to our house and, you know, let the kids, the younger kids play with it and a uh, cute little dog. I mean, just first time he showed up with it, he was a puppy and it was in the pocket of like his cargo like, shorts, cargo <laughs> shorts. Yeah. You know, it was ah, and because of that dog. I now have four multi poos. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. You became a believer in multi poos. Okay. Craig. Uh, I just, I was looking, going to shelters and stuff, looking for champ which was his dog's oh. name. Oh, yeah. And the kids started pulling, the heart, tugging on the heartstrings. You know, can we get a dog? Can we get a dog? Mm. And, and thought we had found Champ at one point, and it wasn't him. And the owner came and claimed it, but we were going to get that dog, you know, if that hadn't have happened. Right. In fact, I'd taken my younger kids to the pound to go adopt that dog, but the owner showed up right before we got there and snatched him back up, so... Okay. So when you say you were going to look for Champ the dog, you're saying that he was chipped and you can maybe identify him that way. Was he chipped? Was he not chipped? No, he, he was not chipped. Best dog. Best I know. Wow. I was, okay. getting, I was getting tons of messages via social media or text messages or whatever. Uh, of people sending pictures of pictures. dogs that have been found or brought sending in. Sending dogs. And yeah. The uh, lady that would babysit Champ never chase would go out of town she even went to me on a number of occasions to go look at dogs to verify if it was him or not because she'd obviously seen the dog a lot more than i had so yeah she was a very good person to have go and you know identify the dog on my behalf and like i said okay. we we went a few times and you know she was like no that's not him that's not him that's not him so Okay, so you, when not only when Chase went missing, you went looking for the dog too. That of course could have led you to, to Chase. Certainly, that's a great idea. Um, did uh, do you know if the dog had like a unique collar? Like, since I see that you're like Houston Texans fans, did he like have a Houston Texans collar or something like that? Do you even know? No, I don't know. I never uh -huh. signed with a collar on. I oh. mean, I was like finding the dog is useless because the dog's not going to tell us what happened to Chase. So I was like totally over the whole <laughs> okay. looking okay. for the dog business. Um, okay. Well, you never know, but I can see that attitude. Sure. Yeah. So I'm like, what good is that going to help? Or, I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I was 
I know some of us were grasping at different straws and that was not one of the straws I was grasping at. Okay. Um, so you go over there with these two friends. Somehow they are able to figure out a way to open the sliding glass door, even though it was seemingly locked, I guess. And you go in there, just kind of looks like Chase walked off with his dog and maybe you're standing there. Maybe you're thinking maybe he'll come back a half hour. You know, he's just, is that, was that something that was in your mind? Um, I wasn't thinking necessarily that he would come back. Um, I mean, I wasn't certainly going to wait around for it. Um, I had my toddler with me at the time. My, my, um, ex-husband was at work. So I had to bring him along and I like was refusing to put him down because I didn't want him touching anything. Um, I was trying real hard not to touch anything because, you know, I've seen enough mm -hmm. criminal minds and, you know, things like that. So I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't want my fingerprints on anything in this place. So, um, I don't want to say I was in a hurry to leave, but I, it was like I said, it was just an eerie feeling being sure. in there. Um, especially like going in without a key. Um, so I was just like, nah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't recall specifically just thinking like maybe he'll show up or. Okay. What did his, uh, the two guy friends, I'm going to guess probably that maybe two guys, friends of chase know him better maybe then you did, you know, is, you know, a chase of social life, especially since you're married, you have a child. What did those two say uh, that you remember, if you know, what were they saying while the three of you were just looking around this place inside? What, any, any insight they had at all? Um, I don't remember anything that they were saying necessarily. I think we just kind of were none of us really knew what to expect. Like I said, were we going to find a body? Were we going to find, you know, like, gunshots, bullet holes, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. it was just, it was just a very strange, just a strange yeah. feeling. It's really the All only right. way I can describe it. Um, but I don't recall either of them specifically what type of conversations we had, to be honest. Okay. Now we're going to get into this a little later, but while you were there, you had the, uh, the very intelligent idea of taking pictures uh, where, how did that even pop into your mind? How many pictures did you, did you take? And this is certainly going to be relevant later. Why did you do that? Um, that was the first time, truthfully, the first time I ever in my life saw marijuana. Um, and there was a ball of it on his coffee table or some paraphernalia. Um, okay. I immediately, I, sent, I know I sent it to my mom, might have sent it to my dad. I'm like, did y'all know about this? Because I was a super naive married sister who like I said up to that point had never even in my life seen marijuana in person. Okay. Um, so more or less being the tattletale that I was, um, it's carried all with me throughout my adulthood. Cause I'm a real follower, um, was just basically like, did y'all know this was going on? Because I had no idea, which isn't uncommon. Chase would tell me would purposely not tell me things because he didn't want to hear my opinion on them. Um, and so that's really, I mean, and that was the only picture that I took that day was okay. just a coffee table, um, okay. had a bottle of Dr. Pepper on it, at various things, a phone, a journal, pizza box. Yeah. I mean, it was just like, like I said, a bachelor pads type of, I think there was like a hundred dollar bill on the table. Um, mm -hmm. Just very, okay bachelor patty <laughs> okay and by the time everybody's seeing us and hearing us i will have posted uh the picture that you took when you got there on july 4th and we're going to compare it with the picture from a few days later and we'll get uh to to the uh to that in a moment so you're there um not much to see maybe you're a little surprised by finding the marijuana there but there's no signs of violence no signs that uh, Chase and his dog had been taken against their will. Of course, nothing seemed to be stolen. The truck's there. The truck keys are there. And it sounds like there were some valuable things in there that were still there. It wasn't like a robbery or anything. Okay. Um, so then what happens next? Of course, that is July 4th. Maybe you already had plans for to celebrate July 4th. Um, Craig, eventually, though, you go over to the apartment uh, yourself. Maybe uh, maybe you took part in this as well, Heather, the second time around. But what can you tell uh, the listeners and viewers about the next visit you made to uh, Chase's apartment? What date was that? 
must have been on the fifth. I'm assuming because I had sent him a text message saying, we know everything, please contact us. So the gig was up. You were hiding this from everybody. We know about all of it now. You're talking about the marijuana, just to be clear. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, we still didn't hear from him. And whenever I got over to the apartment, saw what I saw, uh, I pretty much resigned myself at that point that I'd never see him again. Huh. And okay. I've felt that way ever since, you know, okay. nothing's with no leads, with no information <clears throat> forthcoming from the Harris County Sheriff's Department. Uh, I've got no reason to think otherwise, you know. Okay. Um, but let's just uh, let me just stick to that day for a little bit. Once again, July, if you believe it was July 5th, maybe it was July 6th, but we can go with July 5th for that. So you get this, of course, this text from uh, Heather and it shows this marijuana and that's what you're talking about. So you get that. You're very, very surprised. And we're going to get into a little more in depth. You go over there. How did you get into the uh, apartment the same way that they did through the sliding glass door? Or was there a landlord there? How did you get in? I don't remember. I don't mm. recall. I okay. want to say his mom may have been there. I think she may have been on his lease. And okay. they had let us in. I okay. think. Don't. I'm not going to. I'm not okay. swearing to that. But that's. I'm thinking that's what happened. Uh, that's what I recall. Was that okay. mom. Got, she had like shown her license. And however they were able to connect the two of them together. And she was like I'm his mom. He's not there. Um, she's confirming, yes, that is correct. Um, uh, and she, like, it was, I mean, a fight, like an act of Congress for the office people to finally let her, um, let them into the apartment. Okay. So, Craig, uh, who was with you that time when you went? Obviously, Craig, uh, your ex-wife, uh, Chase's mother, uh, was there anybody else with you, too? May have been the property manager at the time but okay. that's oh uh, i know we had gone back a few days later i had uh, a neighbor of my brother's was actually one of the lead detectives on 48 hours the tv show mm -hmm. and he was like one of the lead detectives on that television show and he was a neighbor of my brother and he had contacted him and he was nice enough to come out and do an investigation over at the apartment. And there we had gone back to the apartment. Uh, the bulb or ball or whatever it was, a marijuana and the hundred dollar bill was mm -hmm. gone from the coffee table. Never chased his mother and I, and this detective had gone back over there. Uh, he canvassed around the apartment complex, talking to the neighbors around. And uh, that's how we surmised that he was helping somebody move on that Saturday. And he was wearing red shorts. And this past Saturday, so July 1st. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, So what you're saying is Heather sends you this picture of showing the $100 bill. So you have something to compare it to. So when you go over there like the next day and maybe even a few days later, something had changed. Something Correct. had changed. And we have those pictures. They've already been posted. Uh, the first picture was taken by Heather. Who was the second picture taken by? Was that taken by you, Craig, or by your ex-wife? Who took the second picture? I think my mom had sent it to me. Okay. All right. So we have these two pictures. So Heather with uh, Chase's two friends are there. Uh, she takes this picture, which I think is uh, it was a great thing to do. And then the next day, Craig, you show up, and then a few days later, show up again, and things have changed. So seemingly, somebody was in that apartment in the meantime. Absolutely. Seemingly. Okay. And most of, and the phone, once again, we're going to get a little deeper into this. So you go back. But other than that, would you say, Craig, that the apartment pretty much was the same thing that Heather encountered when she went on July 4th, except, for, of course, for that coffee table? 
the way you understand it. The way I understand it, yes. Okay. Now we should make a point of something. We're going to get into this a little bit uh, deeper uh, later. You both were surprised finding marijuana there. You did not know that the chase was into that. And we're going to get into this deeper. But from both of you, what you said in prior conversations is there was not a huge uh, amount of marijuana there. In fact, in addition, there wasn't, you didn't see any money in there either. Maybe you had it hidden somewhere, but you didn't see any money in there. At, and when I say money, I mean cash. You didn't see any cash there either, except for that $100 bill. Correct. Yes, there okay. was um, a money counting machine though. Okay. All right. Which led me to believe that he was moving large quantity well, of marijuana. Could be. Very well could be. We'll, we'll, so we'll certainly come back to that in a bit. But let's just go right to filing the missing persons report. What date was it filed? You've already talked about this police officer getting involved. What did the police do once they got this report? Did they go talk to neighbors? Um, you know, any of that. What, what did the police do? Searches, anything like that? They... They came out, looked at the apartment, took a lot of photos. Uh, was basically dismissing it because there had already been so much traffic in the apartment. Mm. Uh, the friends, sisters, mother, the father, you know, a uh, number of people had already been in there. And somebody beyond that was in there, obviously, because of the mm -hmm. things that were missing since the first time that any of us had been in there. Yeah. So like I said, they were kind of dismissing it because of it not being a virgin crime scene anymore at this point. You know, there had been so much traffic in there. Yeah. So. Okay. So they went and talked to the neighbors. Um, neighbors hear anything, see anything. You talked about maybe he was helping somebody move on July 1st. Uh, have you ever been able to track this person down who he was allegedly helping? Anything like that? Now, the police talked to the apartment people, management at the apartment, said they don't have any recollection of anybody moving out hmm. that day, blah, blah, blah. I mean, the apartment complex themselves, those people have been very non helpful whatsoever. Oh, okay. I mean, they, they would not lift a finger to give us help us in any way shape form or fashion i mean okay. it's really been frustrating and that okay that's that's interesting okay so apartment not um being very helpful uh in your opinion given that the police went in there and saw what they saw just like you two did uh do you think that their opinion of this disappearance was affected by finding the money counter and hearing about the marijuana in there, do you think that that affected them in some way, your opinion? Affected the police? The investigation, yeah. It's like, oh, this guy's into drugs, so we're not going to uh, take it as seriously as we might take somebody else's disappearance. Ever get that, that feeling? Well, what we have been told is that he's a young male and he's not a young blonde female. You know, mm -hmm. those... People go missing or a child. It's yeah, you know, blast across news twenty four seven, and you know, all points bulletin put out on the roadway signs like they do here in Texas and what have you. But mm -hmm. since it was a young male, then there was not that big of emphasis put on them as it would be if it was a young female or like Heather said, a child. Right. Well, and that, I think they were taking also the stance that he's an adult. He has the free will to do whatever he wants. That's true. That is that is true. Okay. Uh, regarding what once it got out, like amongst the people who knew um, Chase, did any of those friends, were, for example, those two uh, friends who went with you over there, and once they found out that this was becoming something, you know, very serious, did any of these friends uh, come forward with any theories, any insight? Uh, anything that maybe Chase had said to them, anything that they, uh, you know, had encountered with uh, Chase in those days and weeks before he went missing. Once again, once they found out that he was actually missing, it just wasn't for a day, but it was like a week or 10 days. Any friends helpful at all? Um, I will say I talked, I was kind of the spearhead of contacting his friends. And, you know, this friend would give me this person's number and this person would give me this. It was 
so consuming. Um, and I don't even think I took any notes or anything, just trying to remember hearsay. Um, but I had people were telling me all kinds of different information Mm -hmm. that had my jaw on the floor. Um, Mm -hmm. things I had no idea about, I mean, even seeing the money counting machine. I mean, I was like, I said, I am so naive in my life that I had never even seen real life marijuana before to where I was like, it was some grass or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I said various people that I had spoke with throughout the course of those days, week or so leading up or after his um, disappearance, it was just mind boggling the information that was unraveling. Now, when you uh, hear about these stories, we don't want to get into any, you know, people just could be saying anything. Um, right. Do you think that there were these, these were people who were just talking just that, you know, we hear a lot of that about all the disappearance, a lot of disappearance that we cover a lot of stories out there. I don't know if any of them are true, but we hear a lot of stories about disappearances. Uh, how in general, what would you say about the overall tone of these? Were these things believable or do you think that they seem maybe a little sensational? I mean, for me, with still having the shock of realizing what he was actually doing, um, Mm -hmm. nothing was beyond impossible to me because I'm just like, he lived a whole nother life that I didn't know about um, or had been living that life um, for at least six months from what I was told. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to say nothing was far-fetched, whether it was true or not do was there any witnesses to those things i I don't know um it was just chase told me this or i heard this or i found out about this um of course a lot of people were like i don't know who i heard that from or who told Mm. me or you know i just i don't know how many mouths it came from before it finally got to my ears okay Let's move on to this. And, uh, you know, this is something that's on the Charlie Project page. Uh, elsewhere, you know, news stories that have been done regarding Chase's disappearance since 2017. And a lot is made of this sighting on seemingly maybe July 1st of somebody seeing Chase with his dog. Uh, when did you first hear about this sighting? Who was this person? What do you, what do you know about this? And do you find this sighting to believe, be believable or not? What, what is the story behind this sighting of him? I think Craig? it was somebody in his apartment complex that saw him. Yeah. What, I agree with what Heather just said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, somebody in the apartment complex saw him moving, um, and the dog was basically just like kind of running around, you know, uh-huh. where they were loading the U-Haul truck. But, okay. uh, all right. Well, maybe I, maybe I can go this a little deeper because I thought maybe one of you had said it or I read it somewhere that this person said that Chase was actually out on the street walking with his dog, and and this person drove by, and it just happened to be somebody who knew Chase. Do you know? Do you know this story? You have you heard this story? I know there was a lot of um, things being said about he was last seen walking his dog. I don't mm-hmm. think necessarily he was walking his dog i think he was just seen with his dog okay. outside of the apartment complex whether okay. he was letting them use the restroom or like my dad said this was the instance where he was helping somebody load up into the u-haul or whatever mm-hmm. and his dog was just like kind of trotting behind him i okay. there's been lots of different versions of that yeah. um from you know just even his friends sharing you know chase was last seen xyz and it has gotten jumbled and twisted to where I don't actually know what the truth was for when he was last seen. Okay. So we can't really bank on the idea at all, not even close to it, that yes, Chase was seen on the street walking his dog. That just doesn't sound believable to you at this point, given all the different stories you've heard. Now, I have heard that he was seen running with his dog. Huh. And... Okay. Based on some of the other stories we heard about people being after him, that sounded somewhat plausible, possibly. But is he any, any form of verifying that information? We have no, nothing, no way to verify that. Okay. Let's move on to this. Now, just to be clear, what is, of course, we know Chase is missing. We know his dog is missing. 
what are the other things that you've been able to determine that are missing? Uh, of course, we have this phone that was in the picture that you took, but um, is it possible that Chase had more than one phone? Is that probable? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. What about his wallet? Was it there? Was it left behind? Was it taken? The wallet was in the truck, actually. Was it? And was uh, his ID, driver's license, things like that, a guy would usually carry in his wallet? Well, are, were all those things there? Yes. Wow. But the truck keys were there as well. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. And I think we already talked about this key that he would hide maybe above the door frame or something. That key is also missing. Correct. Okay. All right. All right. We've talked about um, this uh, marijuana issue. And now I think we'll just get into how, how maybe deep and how big that it was right now. And once again, we're only talking about this. We really don't even know. I think, I think maybe the listeners and viewers already know reading between the lines that maybe both of you think that his disappearance has something to do with this. I'm certainly open to that, but we don't want to get into theories, but we're going to talk about it because we must, you know, we must consider it. Um, we went, we're going to talk about this going back to this iron working job. You talked about him getting blackballed and you didn't know that this maybe happened until after he went missing. November 2016, what is your understanding uh, of what happened at his iron working job that might have led him to choose to do what he was doing at the time of his disappearance? Craig, what do you know about that? Only thing I know was that he was what they call red flagged in the industry, meaning mm -hmm. that he could not work in that industry anywhere didn't matter what company or whatever 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 he got written up for was such an gross abuse of common sense mm -hmm. and against safety standards that yeah we're not going to take a chance on you any again period you're done mm -hmm. and like i said that was something that he really seemed to enjoy he yeah. liked the challenge of it. He liked the danger danger in it. Uh, so whenever that got taken away, then, you know, he resorted to what he was doing. Apparently. Getting into the marriage, get, getting into the selling marijuana business. Yes, sir. Okay. Have you ever, and uh, was he being an iron worker, was he in a union? Uh, I do not know the answer. Don't know. Uh, when did you, for, when did you, hear, how did you find out about him being blackballed? How did that even come about to even you finding out about that? Uh, after about the third or fourth investigator that was assigned to his case to the Harris County Sheriff's Department told me that information. Huh. So they looked into it themselves. Well, like I said, we, mm -hmm. up until that investigator, we, had been giving basically zero information about the investigation. This is, had already been going on for three years or so. And all they ever tell us it's an ongoing investigation. We can't disclose that information and just mm -hmm. such crap, you know, very general you statements, grieving mm -hmm. parents yeah. that haven't seen their child in, you know, three years. And they are giving us literally no information whatsoever period, zero zilch. And every time there's a news report about bones being found, you know, we're sitting on pins and needles wanting to find out, you know, could this be the ones that finally end this nightmare for us and still hasn't ended yet. But this investigator who found out about him being blackballed in uh, the ironworking job, you've never been told specifically what Chase did. No, you know, Never. I'm, I'm just assuming that it was one of the videos he had posted of him doing some dancing moves or whatever, you know, just acting silly and mm -hmm. being up on a beam and not being tied off. And people even commented on the video, you know, okay. not very smart, not being tied off, you know, stuff like that. So, OK. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, that might do it. I don't know anything about the ironworking business, but that just could certainly do it if you're just trying to create some uh, like TikTok video or something. Right. right. Yeah. And uh, maybe not realizing, um, you know, and the, the, the codes, the codes that you're breaking. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, but still, we don't know. We're that's a pretty good guess. It sounds like a pretty good guess, but we don't specifically know. But we believe that it happened in November of 2016. 
Let's move on to this. Uh, Addis, Addison Guerra. Uh, who is he? And the reason we're going to talk about it, I'll just say it, is that uh, you have a belief that he is the guy that got Chase into uh, selling marijuana. We'll get into how, how far this went. Uh, who is Addison? How did Chase even know Addison? Um, Madison was one of his friends. They went to um, high school together. Um, over the years, they remained in touch. Um, from what I recall is that Addison went to school um, up in Tyler, Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's kind of where he ended up staying. He met um, who ended up becoming his wife up there. Um, Chase was a groomsman and his wedding Wow. Um, so, I mean, they were, they were pretty close friends to my yeah. knowledge. Um, okay. But I also was in college and, you know, living my own life. So I don't know. Okay. You have any Craig, thoughts? Craig, did uh, you know of Addison Guerra? Uh, I had no knowledge of him until all this, all this happened. Until started. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mom, but- I know his mom knew of him, uh, but I was, okay. I never, Ever met the guy before. Okay. All right. And you had you even heard his name at all? Before? I had heard his name. Uh, Chase had shown me some pictures of a truck that he had built and was taken out to SEMA for the custom. Wow. Uh, SEMA show so in Las Vegas. Vegas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it was a very expensive looking truck. I don't, I remember it was you know, impressive for a kid that age to have a truck like that. So, okay. Uh, but this is some guy that Chase knew from high school. Yes. yes. Okay. And after the fact, of course, once you found out about going to Chase's apartment and seeing what was in there, somehow eventually you came to the belief, the theory that it was Addison that got him into that business. That's something that came to your mind. Uh, pretty much confirmed. Yes. Okay. All right. We'll come back to that later. Uh, now, just to maybe for the, to understand what we're talking about here, you eventually found out that Chase was flying to and from California. How did you find this all out? And it, you believe it had something to do with the marijuana that, that he was selling seemingly out of his apartment. How did you even find out about this? There was boxes in the apartment that smelled of the product, uh, boxes that 99% of them had labels torn off. One particular box didn't, had a California address on it. Uh, Going through the mail that we found in the apartment was a Southwest Airlines rapid rewards, air miles, whatever had extraordinary amount of miles on it uh, going through bank records it shows you know buying tickets through the banking banking account and wow. huh. a list of, list of the flights you know back and forth uh, okay yeah, they were. Would you say once again to your recollection, was this exclusively to California, or was he flying to like Florida, New York, or was it exclusively California? Exclusively California. Okay. And it turned out that somebody. Uh, I don't know if we want to get really get into in the uh, in the for this conversation about who this was, but you found out eventually that somebody who you both know very well was what we might call running interfer- interference for Chase while he was doing this, somebody who was lying about this. So yes. like early in this conversation, I think Craig, it was you who said something like, you know, you, you, the uh, Chase would say he had to go places. He was going here. He was going there. When in reality, probably he was getting on a plane to go to California. Correct. Possibly. And there, once again, there was somebody who both of you know very well who was lying for him. Right. Yes. Okay. Did this person finally uh, come clean, and why did this person finally come clean? I confronted him about it, and I told him to think long and hard before he answers. 
because mm-hmm. I know a lot more than what he may think I know because I had read text messages between the two of them. So I knew he was running the interference for him. Okay. And I knew what some of the cover stories were. So mm-hmm. that's when I told him, I want to know what you know. Mm-hmm. And like I said, think long and hard before you lie to me because I know a lot more than you may think I know. Mm-hmm. And he basically told me this, told me the situation, what was going down, how it was going down. And that's basically how I found out about the flights going back and forth to California. I guess maybe when we started digging deeper into the bank account and to uh, Southwest Airlines rewards account and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Now we should, what's probably most important about this, but this wasn't something that happened right away. I have it in my notes. It was like 10 months before this, uh, before you confronted this person. So this person, even after Chase was gone for, let's say, nine months, this person st- still did not come forward and say, hey, I got something to tell you. He still no, didn't do that. I wouldn't. You say you've got it in your notes. Yeah. I don't recall it being that that far out. Okay. Well, uh, that was how long it was until I found out, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, okay. That's All right. probably more true. Okay. So when, you can, yeah. so when you confronted this individual... How long would you say it was after his disappearance, after Chase's disappearance? Uh, it wasn't real long because was it before the end of the summer? Was it before like okay, it turned yeah, fall it was, in Texas, or what would you say? Yeah, it was. When did when did uh, Spiro start those searches around the apartment? Um, I mean, it was within a couple weeks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I found, I, found a, I found out a week or two after. Okay. And then did you immediately go to this person and, and confront him immediately when you found out, Craig? Uh, yes. Okay. And I guess what we should also say is even though Chase, let's just say Chase had been missing for two weeks, this person needed to be coaxed into telling the truth, even though he knew that Chase was missing. Yes. Right. If you'd not confronted him to this day, we might not, he might have not said anything possible. It's possible. Possible. All right. So once again, the only reason he said anything is because you confronted him and he probably knew as well. He should have, that if he didn't tell the truth, uh, you know, some bad things were going to happen. I think he would have been well within your right to do that, Craig. All right. So somebody knew something about these flights and everything didn't say anything. Okay. Uh, do we know anything about any of Chase's customers and how he was finding his business? Do we know about people going over to the apartment? You know, anything like that? I'm not aware of any of that, no. Um, I only know what, I, just a little bit ago when I was scrolling through pictures, screenshots mm-hmm. of conversations um, that I don't even have numbers saved for, so I can't even say who it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they were saying that um, a neighbor from his complex said that he had a lot of traffic from black people in and out um, that Chase's apartment was the safe house is what they believed. And I was, again, me being naive. I said, what does that even mean? Is that where the money was kept? Um, this person again, whoever it is, cause I don't recall um, said probably why he always met me outside his apartment all the time. And they came back and said, that's where they operated out of. Okay. So, all um, right. So we, even right, so we, was a conversation with me, or if this was a screenshot between two other people that was sent to me, because this was from July 9th of 2017. All right. So what we're talking about here is uh, if people don't know is this seems like a, a I, I'm, once again, I don't know anything about the marijuana business. I I'm not 420 friendly at all. Nothing like that. So I can identify with both of you that this is all a uh, bit Greek to me. But this sounds like a considerable operation that Chase had gotten into fairly quickly within six months. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, there's a reason we talked about the softball team earlier in this conversation. You heard about a softball story. What is this story that kind of goes along this direction? That they were on a trip to New Mexico and somebody said something. 
oh, that Chase told him that they he had a cartel number. He had a number for a cartel in his phone. Chase told somebody else on the team that? Yes. Wow. Okay. Do you know when this trip was? Do we know the date of it? Do we know anything about, was it 2017? Anything about it? It, I believe it was right before all of this happened. Wow. So midsummer, getting to midsummer of 2017. Um, it was, yeah, it was before, it was before all of this happened. Um, they were, again, I don't know who sent this to me, but somebody had sent, um, me a screenshot of like a group, um, a group message called Boomtown Tourney. Um, and they sent a screenshot with, I guess, a um, tournament that was coming up in August. And Chase said, would be sick. I just, or no, somebody said, would be sick. And Chase said, I just want to ring somehow. But I believe all of that was, like, he, this was the team that was, he was in New Mexico with, like, mm -hmm. a weekend or two prior for this tournament. I think it was mm -hmm. Joe that he was with in New Mexico and that's how he met him. Okay. So just uh, on this trip, Chase is kind of uh, saying something about knowing allegedly somebody in a drug cartel in Mexico. Yes. Okay. I don't know if he was just the big talking or not. We, we're, I guess we're not sure, sure. Now, what I will just make a comment. I think what is important for all of us to, to realize, though, is that it sounds like, to me, it sounds like a big operation. I was not, of course, in the apartment. Both of you were. You saw the money counting machine. You saw what was on the table. You saw what these boxes that were being shipped to, from California seemingly to Texas and maybe back to California as well. But the truth is very little marijuana was found in his apartment and no cash was found in his apartment too. So coincidentally, he goes missing, but neither of those two things that he was mostly involved in were there. Right. Right. It's kind of, I don't know if, whether we're supposed to believe that was a coincidence or somebody went in there and maybe took it all out after he went missing or maybe Chase himself took it. But that is, you'd think somebody, uh, the, the disappearance was spur of the moment that some of these things would be left behind, but they weren't. Okay. How about a bank account? Given that this is, uh, have you ever been able to track down a bank account that Chase had anywhere, even going back to before he seemingly got into this, like as an iron worker, uh, bank at Citibank, Bank of America, PNC, have either of you, anybody ever been able to track down a bank account that he had? Yes. You have. Yeah, we did have okay and were you able to find her account for a while so she was able to oh. because she wasn't on the account she was able to grab get the records i believe okay anything of note regarding his bank records that you know about showed very little money in it he was paying the electric bill basically week to week huh and didn't make a lot of sense for i mean Whenever he had his truck payment coming up, he'd make a deposit to cover the truck note or rent. But like I said, his light bill was paid week to week, which is extremely <laughs> paying your luck. Uh, yeah, business. I've never he heard of anybody doing that. Work that way, but okay. How I didn't know even know that power companies even build by the week. <laughs> yeah. I thought they just built by the month or maybe the year. Okay. No, news to me. I, I didn't understand it. Okay. All right. Let's move on to this. Now in retrospect regarding, we'll move on to some other things. Um, in retrospect, five years, over five years later, in your opinion, how many people knew that Chase was not in the iron working business, but it was in the marijuana selling business. Can you even put a number on it? How many people were withholding this information? Not, you know, he's a grown man, I guess. What I are they going to say? say but how many people do you know? How knew everybody about knew it, but his family would be my guess. Is that right? Okay. I don't think everybody knew the extent to what he was doing it, but do I think, I believe like his friends and people knew that he was 
dealing drugs, whether in some capacity. Okay. All right, let's move on to something else. Um, did Chase own any guns? And if so, are any of them missing? Did any somebody may, maybe else have them? What do you know about, uh, did he, being that he was dealing with, doing what he was doing, did he carry a gun? Of course, you're, it's legal to do that in Texas. Did he own one? Anything missing? He had some, yes. Yes, he had guns, some of which are missing. Are they? Um, okay. I know at one point in time, he had at least two pistols, one of which I was told by him was stolen out of his car. Okay. Uh, I had gotten a call from HPD one time trying to find, trying to get a hold of him because they had a pistol supposedly that was registered to him that they had taken off someone else. So it may have been a stolen pistol. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, could have been something that he had warrants or whatever outstanding on him and they were using that as a sting operation type thing to get him to come in to claim the pistol and bam, you know, mm -hmm. we got you now, you know, I don't know. Okay. Uh, but no, no guns were found in his, uh, in his apartment. No guns were found in his car. There were a couple of, couple of shotguns. I believe it was found oh. in the apartment. And, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. We took those. Um, I had my toddler, so I told um, his friend, Brandon, that was at the apartment with me to go ahead and um, take those with him. And then later on, he met up with my dad and and got them. He got okay. them. Okay. Okay. Now, there's this story, of course, we talked about uh, the dog, Champ, and we talked about uh, what he is. I think we already talked about that he's not chipped, unfortunately. Um, but he was supposed to get groomed the previous Thursday, but that didn't happen. Uh, do we have any more information about this? Is this something like Chase canceled the appointment? You know, uh, it seems uh, like strange that that would happen, but what do we know about the, the grooming appointment getting canceled? Um, from what I recall was he had tried to get the appointment for oh. that previous week. Um, and she didn't have any available. Oh, okay. That was my understanding of that. Okay. All right. So he didn't have an appointment and missed it. He was trying to get an appointment like at the last minute and she just right. wasn't available. Right. Okay. Not sure what to make of that. And uh, maybe that was supposed to be the day before the softball game, which was uh, that Friday, maybe that Thursday, June 30th or something like right. that. So he's trying to get it uh, and never gets the dog groomed. Now we're going to go back. I think, you know, I think these pictures, uh, this, these two pictures, we're going to come back to them once again. And like I said, they have already been posted, posted on Facebook, on Twitter, on our website, theunfoundpodcast.com. You could do a comparison between two of them. But we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Of course, Heather, you're there on July 4th. You take the picture of this table, probably not at the time, maybe realizing you took it for one reason, but now the picture has become important for another reason. Right. And then a few days later, you said that your mother went and kind of took the same picture that you did. So for people who have looked at the pictures, uh, we'll just kind of uh, spell it out to them. So you take this picture on July 4th, Heather, and it has um, the marijuana in the picture, the money in the picture, and that phone in the picture. But then your mother goes a few days later, the marijuana is not in the picture, the $100 bill is not in the picture, and that's strange by themselves. But anybody who's looked at the pictures closely can see that the phone that is in the picture you took on July 4th is not the phone that's in the picture on July 6th, correct? Correct. All right. And it's very obvious because the iPhone, I think, is the first one, and it has like a white frame. It's like it has a white tint to it. And the phone that's in the other picture from the 6th has a black frame. And it's not even an iPhone. It's like, oh, I think we just talked about this. Uh, it's like an LG phone. Um, has anybody ever admitted going into the apartment during that time? Because obviously whoever was in there put that other phone there on purpose. I, 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 any insight? Uh, we, I, we usually don't like to do theorizing in these episodes or in these interviews because we want to let people think for themselves. But either of you, 
any insight into this at all? Or has anybody else even looked at those pictures and offered any insight into this at all? Any thoughts on it? None. Zero. Uh, had, like, who had access? Who could have had access to that apartment? Maybe I'll ask you this. Maybe I'll ask you a different question, Heather. Who knew, Heather, that you and those two friends went there on July 4th? How many people knew that? Um, I would say both of the guy's wives were there. Um, and then uh, my ex-husband knew that I was going. My sister was there, but didn't stay for us to get into the apartment. So she knew we were there. Mm. Um, and then I had told my parents that I was mm. there. Okay. And maybe these two other guys could have told maybe some other people or something. Right. You know, and right. who knows who they told. But right. still not a very big circle of people. Right. You know, let's just say less than 20, less than 20 people. And still two days later when your mother, uh, Chase's mother, uh, shows up there and Craig, you're there too. Things are changed. And in fact, it, the, the other phone just wasn't taken. It's gone, but another phone's in its place. I have to admit, I, I'm not sure what to think of that, but people can look at the pictures and then uh, they will determine for themselves as well. You Maybe we should talk about something else. You said that there was a journal there. What, what was in this journal? Uh, it was still there on July 6th, but what was in it? I don't remember. Did, did you look at it, Craig? I did, and I said being five years ago, I honestly don't recall. It seemed like it may have been in some type of a ledger. Uh, oh, codes of some, okay. of some sort. Um, mm -hmm. but, do yeah. you have, do you have that journal or do the police have it? Uh, I don't know. I, th okay. I believe the police have it. If I'm not okay. mistaken. Okay. Well, if you have it, I mean, certainly I'd like to see what was in, of course, because that's what right. I do. Uh, but if you don't have it, that's fine, too. I can certainly understand if the police do have it. Regarding maybe just the general question that I ask about phones, um, the belief is that he did have another phone, which a lot of people who uh, do what he was doing uh, have them. Any pinging done on the phone, any phone records uh, that we know about, anything regarding any of his phones? The, what Harris do we know County, about any County, of that? Harris County supposedly did all that. It, all that pinging of the phone and subpoenaing, subpoenaing phone records and all that. But like I said, I was never made privy to what those things result, what those resulted in. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to Addison Guerra, uh, the person you believe who uh, opened up this uh, world to chase in the first place what did he have to say about all of this once uh once chase uh went missing uh how what did he have to say did either of you have any interaction with him at all he tried calling me and talking to me and i had nothing to say to the kid just because of what was involved and what he got him involved in i i had nothing mm -hmm. um, i spoke with him twice um I don't recall what all was mentioned. I do remember um, I had called him the second time after finding out something that he failed to tell me the first time. Um, mm -hmm. So I was pretty upset that he, I mean, it was kind of a big deal that he had kind of, he had left that out intentionally from, mm -hmm. you know, telling me, but mm -hmm. as far as offering information, I mean, he knew that Chase was in the business. Um, they Chase went to Tyler, went up to Tyler where he lived. I don't want to say real often, but I mean, to our knowledge or to my knowledge, um, sporadically, um, Addison was one of his good friends. So he went to go visit um, him and his family up there. But mm -hmm. I mean, nothing sticks out as him being like overly upset or um, really offering any kind of solutions or um, information as to what or how we could find Chase. 
Okay. At any point, do you know, did Addison ever lawyer up when being questioned about Chase's disappearance? Absolutely, he did. He did. Okay. And I will be talking about, uh, maybe I should ask you this. How did you even, once again, I realize neither of you knew about this until Chase went missing, but how did it come to your attention that you found out or you believed that Addison was the person who got Chase into this? How did that information even come to you? Do you remember? I believe it was through the interview that the uh, investigator that was a friend of my brother's, he did a phone interview with him, mm. and I believe it came out then. Okay. All right. So they're friends. Maybe Addison's already into it. Maybe. And Chase needs a job after getting kicked out of being an eye worker. And this seems like a viable alternative. And maybe Addison helped him get into that. And that's seemingly what came out in this interview by a police officer talking to Addison. But once again, eventually when he was asked about Chase's disappearance, it, it, um, specifically, he didn't want to talk about it. Correct? Yeah, he claimed not, not to know anything about it. Okay. And I will be talking, given, uh, and I've given you, uh, all, both of you, some information I found out about Addison. I will be talking about some of it, not all of it, but some of it after this interview is over. Um, but the listeners and viewers should know uh, this is information that, that Heather and Craig already know. Just me looking into Addison, and uh, maybe I should ask you this. Chase had... Uh, had an, uh, you know, um, a certain opinion of Addison about Addison was living pretty large, something yeah. like that. Yeah, Correct. That, Correct. Yes. We talked about this truck earlier. Okay. And I was able to look into that for myself. It just gives everybody an inkling about what I'll be talking about. Okay. Let me ask you this. I just have to ask you this. Being that seemed, Chase seemed like a good guy. I, of course, didn't know him. You both knew him. Good guy, friendly guy, personable, funny, obviously doing something that uh, he shouldn't be doing, keeping it from the people he cared about the most. I just have to ask you a point blank, blank question. You know it's on the interview outline. I'll just ask you. Is it possible Chase walked off to a new life, given that he knew he couldn't keep everyone in the dark forever? Have you thought about that? Or maybe have you thought about, say you had, he was, wasn't missing and you'd found out about all of this, how would you have reacted to this, you know. Well, I'll, I'll say this. I jokingly had my ex-son-in-law go with me to follow up on a tip to Beaumont, mm -hmm. Texas. Okay. And seemed like credible tip. Seemed like a guy knew the description and the information that he relayed was information that only Chase would know. So hmm. got my son-in-law or former son-in-law to go with me to Beaumont. And I said, I'm bringing you with me to pull me off of him if we do find him, jokingly. Yeah. But like I said, Chase knows how I felt about drugs unequivocally. Uh, mm -hmm. He had been involved in this stuff before called me for help to get him out of a jam that he was in. We did so. And I said, don't ever call me for this again. Mm -hmm. I said, you know how I feel about this. I don't condone it. I don't like it. And all it's going to do is get you hurt. And right. You know, you better find new friends and find them fast because this ain't happening again. Yeah. And okay. That was a couple of two or three years prior to him going disappearing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I was like, yeah. And and I want you to know, Craig, that my dad's the same way. I mean, uh, my dad's eighty five now, and he's actually right over in the other room. I'm, the listeners are familiar with his background. I've done uh, interviews and 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 the episodes from here before, but my dad's the same way that you know i never did anything like that so he never had to worry but you know my dad would have been the first person to turn me in had i been doing something like that you know for sure my mother too my mother's not alive anymore but her too 
So I get what you're saying, you know, Craig, that you take this stuff very seriously. You're anti-drugs. You know, you're very uh, disappointed in your son. And it very well could have been if you caught him in doing this, you might have turned him in too. Possible? Damn, damn possible. Okay. So there you go. And that's the, the everybody knows those, that's the right thing to do. So, there, you know, that's, that's the way it should be. So, um, but we, but once again, we think about disappearances, we have to consider that. Okay. Um, how hard has this been? Of course, we have Craig, you the father, Heather, you're the sister. Um, how have you two? And of course, you have another sister, uh, Craig, you have another daughter, and then you have other children, maybe a little younger. Uh, but still, how have you all as a team, as a family, uh, tried to deal with this over the, the past five years? Obviously, the disappearance itself. And then finding all these other things out about Chase that unfortunately I had to find out after the fact. Um, what can you say about all of that? Probably my best defense mechanism for all this has been my anger towards it all, if that makes any sense. Uh, like I said, he knew unequivocally how I felt about drugs, marijuana, and what have you. Mm -hmm. And to hear some of the stories that have come out about him since all this, like I said, literally makes my blood boil. Yeah. Uh, like I said, severely disappointed because, you know, whenever I mentioned this before, I first my walked in that apartment and the smell, you know, of what was in there, yeah. the money counting machine, what have you. Uh, uh, I basically said to myself, then I'll never see him again. I don't mm -hmm. think that he just walked off the face of the earth. I think that he was talking up what he could provide somebody and they fought in the apartment, cleaned him out, took care of the cash that was there, took out the marijuana that he had and they did away with him. And his dog. As well as the dog or used the dog for Okay. A cheat toy for their Rottweilers or what have you. I know in movies and stuff, they show drug people with, you know, the yeah. big Rottweiler dogs or uh, Dobermans. Do not Doberman, uh, pit bulls. Pit bulls. No, yeah. I, don't, I don't know how many. I, it's Hollywood. We just, I, I want to remind all the listeners we find out a lot of things about disappearances Hollywood doesn't get right. But I, I understand what you're saying. And these are the these are kind of the fears that and thoughts that go through your mind over the last five years. Yeah. You can't help but thinking about things in those terms. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. What about you, Heather? Um, I feel like I've gone through the stages of grief. Um, I've had the anger, you know, I've had the bargaining. If if we could just find him, then, you know, or if he would just come forward, then um, you know, I've had so many dreams of where he just popped up. Like in, you know, we were at a baseball game or a football game or something. And I just like happened to see him at the concession stand. Um, or we were at a family gathering and he just walked through the front door. Like nothing has ever happened. And how, like, I always thought I would just hug his neck first and then slap him across the face second. <laughs> um, but for me and the events in my life that's happened in that five years, um, I've had another son who shares a same middle name as Chase. Um, he's not necessarily named after Chase, but um, the, the middle name is um, a family name. Mm -hmm. um, my oldest son is, he'll be seven in August. Um, he still remembers bits and pieces, which is crazy because he was two, yeah. almost, almost two whenever he right. went missing. Um, yeah. But we do talk about him, but it's just, different moments impact me differently. Um, we were driving to school one day, um, this past school year. So pretty recent and we passed a cemetery and my son, my oldest said, mommy, can we go look in there? Maybe uncle Chase is in there. Um, so things like that, um, are kind of gut punches, yeah. um, you know, to know that he doesn't even know that he has another nephew, um, I have since remarried. I have two stepdaughters now. Um, ironically, my new, my husband now, um, is also an iron worker. Wow. Um, 
which, yeah, that was, um, I had never known anybody else other than Chase, who was an iron worker. It's not a super common job. Uh Um, and he has heard, he didn't know Chase, but people he works with had heard of him and known of him and stuff like that. But, um, it's just different moments, different things have been super triggering, um, songs come on the radio that take me instantly back to a memory, um, of something we were doing or something that made me think of him. Um, I, however, I don't want to say because I'm a sister, um, but because I have my own family and yeah, I like, I could not devote my life to chase. Right. Uh, gotcha. Chase. Like, would I of course help? Yes. But at the beginning it was very consuming to me. I wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping. Um, I was just researching and basically playing FBI agent that yeah. I had seen on TV and doing all the things I knew to do to try and figure out because, you know, the first 48 is the most important time. Mm-hmm. So, um, I don't want to say I was neg- neglecting my son. My son was being fed, but I wasn't spending time with him. I wasn't spending time with my family. I had my computer in my face, phone in hand, doing everything I could. And, um, so I don't want to say I'm removed from the situation. I, I am just not as involved. Yeah. As yeah. What I mean, had if it was my son, it would be a completely different ball game, of course. Um, so I can't speak on that from my parents, mm. but um, I know for my mom, it's been um, incredibly difficult. Um, she's, you know, had issues with sleeping and, you know, other mental health things and stuff like that. But I mean, at the end of the day, like for us, you know, people are like, how, you know, y'all are so strong. How are you getting through it? I'm like, life goes on for me, it Does uh, you know, sitting around dwelling on it, even for my mom, like she was back at work, you know, days afterwards, as well as I believe my dad was. Um, and they're like, why are you here? And she's like, what am I going to do? Sit at home and cry, you know? And it's just, we have to keep our minds busy. And I, I mean, I have four kids now and a husband. And, and I mean, to say that my days are boring, <laughs> you know, it would not be true at all. Like, yeah, right, right. I always have some, it's a miracle. Nobody has bust through the door to try and find me yet. Honestly. Um, you have your, uh, uh, yeah. So just, and and you know, the other, I have you, my life. It's, yeah. You have your own life to live. And we talked about this in a text message. You right. have your own life to live. That's totally true. And, and, and you're all, yeah, yeah. I had also, you know, had the thought if, all of this was true or whatever. You don't get into dealing drugs, not knowing the repercussions of what could happen. That's right. So to say he didn't know this could have happened is not true. Like he knew what he was getting himself into. And if this is the life he chose for himself, that's the life he chose. And nothing that I was going to say or do would have stopped it. So, um, you know, he's not a child who could have been easily swayed one way or the other, because we all tried for years to keep him on the straight and narrow. Um, but ultimately he was a money chaser and that's why I think he ended up in the situation he's in. Okay. Uh, Heather, you're right. You have your own life to live. And, and you're also right. The world keeps moving. The world keeps spinning. Uh, you know, um, you know, Chase, at least once again, in unfound land where I live, you know, Chase's disappearance isn't even that old. The average age of a disappearance we cover on the podcast is like 20 years old or something. And, uh, for families who have been living this for like 10 or 15 years, uh, they, they find out that, you know what? People move on. Um, people continue to live their lives and go to work. And if a guy goes missing and his girlfriend, you know, she'll move on and she'll meet some other guy and she'll get married and the, the world keeps spinning. You're right. right. It's totally true. Um, and, and a lot of these people don't, you know, to be sad about this, but a lot of them don't even bother to check in. You know, they're just so caught up in their own thing. But once again, we're only here for a certain amount of time. So they, they have their own goals and aspirations and everything, everything too. And that's why for me, um, you know, I've devoted, you know, even to the people who have been on the podcast five years ago, you know, I still try to be a resource for them. 
because they need somebody who doesn't move on, even though I may move on to other disappearances every week. All these disappearances are still up here in my head, and I know a lot about them. And so, you know, I try not to move on while, when the rest of the world does. At least that's what I'm trying to do. But you're right, and you can't blame for people for moving on. It's just right. the way it is, or, have, you know, handling their own lives. Yeah. yeah. Um, Facebook page, website, uh, you can uh, name any of that right now uh, if you have it. Finding Chase Allen Lackey on Facebook, uh, a Facebook friend of mine uh, mm -hmm. actually set the page up for us and right. it was, I thought it was a great idea. And like I said, we've had tons of hits on the page and lots of comments and tips and likes, shares and prayers. And mm -hmm. I try to acknowledge each and every one of them that gets put on there and like Heather said, you know, it's so consuming. It is. But they take the time to make a comment or like it or share it. I always try and thank them for it and, you know, let them know that we appreciate it. And, but it is, it is very consuming. And, but, you know, like I said, we got to do what we can do to, you know, hopefully get a finality to yeah. all this ordeal. And it's not going to be a, finality that we like or that we want possibly but you know we definitely could use the closure for sure yeah. heather and craig any final words before we complete this interview uh again i just want to thank you for taking interest in this case and the willingness to, to do the interview and to share it on your podcast forum and like i said we You're appreciate very it very much You're yeah. very kind thank you I agree with my dad. Um, it's, I, I don't even know what kind of research and how much time you've put into this, but, but um, I know even for myself, like getting ready for today, knowing, or, um, you know, my dad had, he was like, Hey, I'm going to give you this. I gave this guy your number so that you can talk about this. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I don't want to say like, I wasn't willing. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. here I am. So I yeah. was, but it's just, it takes a lot um, it does. for me just to, I guess, prepare myself. Um, it's not something I want to relive. Um, yeah. And you've done a very great job of organizing it and asking specific You're questions to where we did not, or I did not have to relive that in a negative way. You're very kind. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, you know, I've done these interviews. I think this is about disappearance 260 now. And uh, there's just the way that I realize this is very difficult. I, you probably, this is probably the most in-depth interview you're ever going to do. Of course, I hope Chase is found alive later today. But if he's not, and this goes for a while, probably this will still be the most in-depth interview uh, that you do. This is just the way I do things. And I understand some of this can um, be like, you know, it's like July 2nd, 2017 all over again, or those days after. I realize that. And that's why we just try to look at things in a very somewhat, even though I know it's emotional, we try to look at it in a very unemotional way. We're just going to talk about the facts like we did in this, you know, who was here, who heard this, who said this, what were the, what, you know, what did you encounter? And this is why I tried the best to stay away from theories and things like that, because then that starts when things can, I, in my experience, can get a little emotional. So I appreciate you saying that. I do try to keep it as simple as possible and easy as possible, even though we do go very in-depth. And I, and I appreciate you, uh, you know, uh, saying that. Thank you. And I appreciate you also being on this episode of Unfound. Thank you for, so much. Thank you for your time, sir. We appreciate it. You're welcome. And those were my July 17th, 2022 interviews with the father of Chase Lackey, Craig Lackey, and one of Chase's sisters, Heather Fretwell. I thank them for appearing on both audio and video for this episode. I also need to thank them for being in the same location for the interviews, which made it much easier for me, the interviewer. You can now see why I named this episode what I did. Chase's family thought he was one kind of person, but they discovered after his disappearance that he was another. But that's not where the theme ends. You heard Craig, Heather, and I talk about Addison Guerra. 
the person who they believe got Chase into shipping in marijuana from California and selling it in the Houston area. Well, Chase was not the only person lying about his life. Addison was not as he seemed either. Chase perceived Addison to be a guy who had made a lot of money selling weed. Craig and Heather mentioned that big truck Addison had that he was going to take to a convention in Las Vegas. Addison, at the time, in 2017, lived in a huge house. He seemed to be doing very well for himself. In fact, if you look hard enough, You'll even find an article about how Addison said he made his first million dollars through his legal businesses by the time he was 23. Yet, I discovered this was all a show. And it should be known, once Addison and his wife got divorced, she posted on social media the very same thoughts. The truth is the same year Addison was making his first million, allegedly, he got caught shoplifting an item that was less than $500. That big house he lived in, he was renting it, coincidentally from a guy who lives in California. Remember, Chase had traveled back and forth to California several times. And all those businesses Addison started, well, he certainly liked to file a lot of paperwork, but it's not clear whether any of them have been successful at all or even still exist. What does this all mean? I'm not sure. The truth is there are a variety of scenarios that are factually possible for Chase's disappearance, and they all don't have to include Addison. However, we must always be concerned in any disappearance when someone close to the missing person is not as he or she seems to be. As for those pictures showing that somebody went into Chase's apartment between when Heather and Craig were there, replacing the phone but stealing the money and marijuana, I'm still trying to perceive the reality of what the explanation could be. I'll leave the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. Right now, while you are in your podcast platform, Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, wherever, give Unfound a five-star review, a thumbs up, whatever that platform allows. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Densel, and you've just finished this episode of Unfound.